Hi y'all and welcome back to Professor True Love's Concepts for Nurses series. And in this episode, we continue our neurological concepts, specifically with spinal cord problems. Anything related to spinal cord injuries or even a little bit about spinal cord tumors. This would be part one. Just for this episode include Iggy's Medical Surgical Nursing 9th Edition and Soul's Introduction to Critical Care Nursing 7th Edition. Initially, let's begin with cervical neck pain. And we need to discuss that with cervical neck pain is going to be a very conservative treatment using soft collars. And in some cases, when the pain has not been relieved, we can think about surgical management, including things called an anterior cervical discectomy or effusion. So conservative treatment is the same as described for any kind of other back pain, except the exercises focus on the shoulder and the neck. So these are your soft muscle exercises and your stretching. If these treatments do not work, a soft collar may be used at night for a period of no longer than 10 days. And if conservative treatment is ineffective, surgery such as an anterior cervical discectomy or fusion is commonly preferred. And in fact, lower back pain that is disabling low back pain, is the single greatest threat to an employee and one of the biggest costs to employers. It is defined as acute pain that is usually self-limiting, but it can continue, and if it does continue for greater than three months, or if repeated episodes occur, it is considered chronic back pain. On the other hand, acute lower back pain is caused by muscle strain or spasm, ligament sprain, disc degeneration or herniation of the nucleus pulpus from the center of the disc. The nurse should conduct a complete pain assessment in patients with a back injury, including the severity and nature of the pain, the location, and precipitating and relieving factors. However, in addition to pain, there may be both muscle spasm and numbness and tingling, which are called paresthesias, in the affected leg. Both legs may be checked for sensory perception by using a cotton ball and a paper clip for comparison of light and deep touch. Bowel and bladder incontinence or retention may occur with a motor nerve impairment, that is involvement, and can impact sexuality. Research demonstrates that preventative measures for health promotion and maintenance are the best intervention to use for people with neck or lower back pain. This includes good posture, proper lifting, exercise, ergonomics, and specific equipment that can be used. This equipment that should be used encourages proper body mechanics or prevents improper mechanics or compensates for weakness or extends the reach of the patient. Non-surgical management begins with proper positioning and alignment drug therapy, not only to relieve the pain, but to decrease any inflammation brought about by the irritation of the muscles or tendons. Heat therapy can be applied to encourage blood flow to that area and encourage a natural healing. Physical therapy to promote movement and activity in those muscles. Weight control to reduce the effect of gravity on the affected muscles and bones and complementary and alternative therapies, including things such as stress reduction and increasing activity. However, if non-surgical management proves ineffective, surgical management will be considered. There is minimally invasive surgery, such as percutaneous lumbar discectomy, thermodiscectomy, and laser-assisted laparoscopic lumbar discectomy, and conventional open surgical procedures, which include a discectomy, a laminectomy, and a spinal fusion. Some definitions. A discectomy is a removal of a disc. A laminectomy is the removal of a vertebrae. A fusion is a removing of a disc and then binding or fusing the remaining disc together. They usually use a donor from pelvis or from a cadaver to form a bridge matrix. Percutaneous means through the skin 
or using a very small cut. Discectomy, therefore, is a surgery to remove the herniated disc material that is pressing on the nerve root or on the spinal cord. Lasers are used in different fields of medicine and confer unique advantages. In the treatment of lumbar disc disease, they are useful and advantageous. Laser discectomy is an outpatient procedure with one-step insertion of a needle into the disc space. Disc material is not removed. Instead, nucleus pulposus is burned by the laser. Laser discectomy is minimally invasive, cost-effective, and free of post-operative pain syndromes and is starting to be more widely used at various centers. It is not a cure-all, but good for the following, including a laser facet joint nerve ablation, also known as a rhizotomy. This is a destruction, ablation of the small nerves that supply the facet joints in an attempt to remove or reduce back pain from the arthritic facet joints. A laser disc decompression, that is the removal or ablation of disc material to relieve nerve, comp nerve compression causing leg pain, and a laser annuloplasty, which is a treatment of tears in the disc wall, that is the annulus, in order to reduce back pain. So post-operative care of the patient undergoing a spinal surgery include prevention and assessment of complications. Now think about this. You're cutting into the spinal cord and your complications could extend all the way from respiratory problems, changes in vital signs, to lack of sensorium and loss of mobility. So do your neurological assessment, double checking your vital signs. Make sure that you assess carefully your patient's ability to void. This is a key marker with spinal cord problems. Monitor for pain, assess the wound and give it proper care. Assess for the leakage of cerebral spinal fluid. Maintain proper patient positioning and to that add proper mobility, maintaining alignment. And your discharge teaching should include home care management and accessing community resources. Frequent causes of spinal cord injuries include motor vehicle crashes or MVCs, falls, gunshot wounds, sports injuries, and diving accidents. And in fact, the majority of SCIs occur between the ages of 16 and 30. Several factors, such as skilled first responders providing in initial intervention, decreased transport time, and implementation of evidence-based guidelines can improve patient outcomes. There are multiple ways that the cervical spine can be manipulated that would cause an injury either permanent or temporary. One is hyperflexion, which is bending of the joints past their design limits. Hyperextension, which is essentially straightening the joints past their design limits. Axial loading or a verbi vertic I'm sorry, vertical compression, which is essentially squishing the spinal column down. Excessive head rotation, beyond the normal range, and penetration by an object such as a bullet or a knife. Important that you differentiate between the different types of spinal cord injuries. So, you should be able to discuss the differences between spinal and neurogenic shock. In spinal shock, there is complete loss below the level of injury. This includes motor, sensory, and reflex activity. However, in neurogenic shock, there is a disruption of the autonomic pathways. Therefore, there is a temporary disruption of autonomic pathways below the level of an injury. And we identify spinal cord injuries at the level of the injury that is the lowest neurological segment with intact or normal functioning. Tetraplegia or quadriplegia and quadriparesis or weakness involve all four extremities, as seen with cervical cord and upper thoracic injuries. Paraplegia and paraparesis involve only the lower extremities, as seen in lower thoracic and lumbar sacral injuries or lesions. Common spinal cord syndromes include a complete spinal cord injury, that is a complete lesion, so this is a term used to describe damage to the spinal cord that is absolute. It causes complete and permanent loss 
of ability to send sensory and motor nerve impulses and therefore it is complete and usually permanent loss of function below the level of the injury. This was a result in complete paraplegia or tetraplegia. The completeness, the completeness of many injuries isn't known until six to eight weeks post-injury. The spinal cord normally goes into what is called spinal shock after it has been damaged. The swelling and fluid masses showing on any resultant x-ray, MRI, or CT scans may well mask the true extent of the underlying injury. Anterior cord syndrome, also known as Beck's syndrome or anterior spinal in artery in syndrome, is a clinical subset of spinal cord injury syndromes due to ischemia infarction of the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord, typically sparing the posterior third. The clinical presentation shows complete motor paralysis below the level of the lesion due to involvement of the cortical spinal tract, the loss of pain and temperature at or below the level of injury due to the involvement of the lateral spinal thalamic tract. Anterior cord syndrome is caused by ischemic injury to the anterior aspect of the spinal cord due to the occlusion of an anterior spinal artery, which normally occurs as a consequence of non-traumatic processes, although it can be traumatic. Posterior cord syndrome, which is also known as posterior spinal artery syndrome, it's rare and is associated with spinal cord injury. It is caused due to a lesion in the posterior column of the spinal cord or occlusion of the posterior spinal artery. brown saccard syndrome is an incomplete spinal cord lesion characterized by a clinical picture reflecting hemisection injury of the spinal cord, often in the cervical cord region. Patients with brown saccard syndrome suffer from ipsilateral upper motor neuron paralysis and loss of proprio perception, as well as contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation. Central cord syndrome, that is CSS, an acute cervical spinal cord injury, is marked by a disproportionately greater impairment of motor function in the upper extremities than in the lower ones, as well as with bladder dysfunction and a variable amount of sensory loss below the level of injury. And although CSS, I'm sorry, CCS has been reported to occur with particular frequency among older persons with cervical spondylysis, it can be found in persons of any age and can be associated with various etiologies, injury mechanisms, and predisposing factors. And that does conclude this episode of Neuro Concepts. Tune in soon, there will be a subsequent episode two, and we'll see you then.